and I want to talk to you a bit about Jesus. Now off the bat, I want to tell you this. Easter Sunday, this Sunday is probably the most crowded Sunday in church. And so there will be a few of us here who are here for the first time this year at church. Or maybe the first time in, or the first of a few times that you will come to church. Maybe you come from a Christian or a Catholic background or an upbringing. And when you were small, your family or your teachers or your parents taught you about Jesus. Taught you about Christmas and Good Friday when Jesus died and Easter when he rose up again from the dead. But as you grew older, your experience, your intellect kind of started leading you away from Jesus. You come out of tradition to church maybe once a year, maybe a few times a year. But the power in the life of Jesus, you don't believe in anymore. Maybe you are here, and you are not from a Christian background. But you are here out of obligation. Somebody invited you to church this morning. Maybe you have a neighbor or a relative. And every few months, they come to you, and they invite you for a church program. And every few months, you say, no, sorry. And maybe they came up to you just before this Easter and they said, hey, it's Easter Sunday. Why don't you come to church with me? And after saying no 50 times over, you felt bad. So you thought, you know, why don't I do a bit of PR? Why don't I appease them and come to church? What harm could it do? Maybe a friend invited you, and you get along well with this friend. But you know that what you think of religion and God and what they think of religion and God is very different. You like them, but you know that you have differences. But out of respect for your friend, when he or she invited you, you came to church. But if you're really honest with yourself, while you love your friend, you can't understand how he or she believes the things that they believe. How can they actually believe that Jesus, a person, died and rose up again from death? How can modern, educated, smart people think that Jesus died and rose again? And if this is you this morning, I want to say, I identify with the essence of that question. Because the centerpiece of Christianity is not just the death, but the rising from the dead, what we call the resurrection of Jesus. If the resurrection is not true, none of it is true. If Easter is not true, none of this is true. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, all we believe is a lie. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we are wasting our time. You are wasting your time this morning. You could have slept for a couple of hours more. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, I am wasting my life choosing to do this as a life path instead of another career. But, if Easter is true, then all of it is true. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, then everything changes. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, it is the greatest story ever told. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you and I have to confront everything that he has said. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, then you and I have to decide what we think of him and what he said. Paul, a Jewish teacher in the time of Jesus, wrote a letter called the letter to the first Corinthians. And in chapter 15, he says this. In verse 14, he says this. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, 
then what I am doing today is useless. Verse 17 says this, And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Paul says that if we actually, if the resurrection of Jesus didn't actually happen, we should be pitied. People should feel shame for us. People should feel sorry for us. Because we believe something that didn't happen. But this is Paul's conclusion in verse 20. After saying all of that, he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Now when I say that, of course, some of you might be thinking, of course, Dishan, you're going to say that. You're a pastor. You work in church. You believe the Bible. Of course, you're going to say that Jesus rose from the dead. But really, Dishan, how do we actually know? How do we actually know? Isn't this just a bunch of stories that people passed on from generation to generation? Word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth. And hundreds of years later, they wrote it all down and they probably exaggerated the details so that it would sound better than it actually is. Isn't this, this where this fable came from? I just want to put this in front of you. Even before we get to the message about what Jesus did for us. Almost without exception, Every reputable scholar in the world who studies the history of that time will agree that there was a man called Jesus in history, a teacher in Palestine, and a man called Paul. Every reputable scholar, and I'm not talking about Christian scholars, I'm talking about across the board, different religions, agnostics, atheists, every scholar agrees that Paul wrote this letter, the letter to the first Corinthians. They agree that he wrote it in the 50s, not the 1950s, the 50s, 50 AD. Most historians agree that Jesus was crucified and executed by the Romans in the 30s. This letter was written less than 20 years after he died. And he says this in chapter 15, verse 3. This is what he says. I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. This is what was, what was most important. Christ, or Jesus, died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, which is Easter Sunday. Just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter, who was one of his closest followers, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Paul says, I'm passing the most important truth to you. Jesus, not only did he die, but he was buried and he was raised from the dead. And he says this. This is just a few years after Jesus died. He says this. Almost 500 people saw him rise again. After they saw him crucified, rise again, they saw him at once. Many other people saw him in different groups before he went to heaven. He says, actually, don't just believe me. Check the facts. Go and ask them yourselves because they're still alive. In modern, in modern words, we'd say, go and Google it. Double check it. He says, even James, even James agrees that Jesus rose from the dead. Do you know who James was? James was the son of Mary and Joseph. Jesus' half-brother. He grew up with Jesus. He played with Jesus. He saw Jesus crucified and killed. And when he rose up again, he believed that Jesus was God. Does anyone here have a sibling by, by a, a brother or a sister? What are the chances that your brother or sister would believe that you are God? I have a sister. When we were younger, we used to fight a lot. Now we don't fight as much because, you know, we've grown up. I would almost say that by now, she probably likes me. But I can tell you something. If I go to her, her name's Sohan, if I go to her and say, Nangi, Nangi, uh, I think I'm God. I could tell you what she will tell me. Actually, I can't tell you what she'll tell me because I can't repeat it on the pulpit as a pastor. And that's probably true for many of the people here. But James 
believed that his brother was the son of God after he saw him crucified and killed and murdered and after he rose up from the dead. James believed it so much that he was willing to die for his belief. The political climate in that, in that, in that, in that stage of history was very anti-Jesus followers. Jesus' followers were being rounded up by the Roman authorities and tortured and killed because they were saying that Jesus had risen up from the dead. If he had actually died and hadn't risen up, wouldn't it be easier for the followers, what we call the disciples, just to say, you know what, he didn't rise up from the dead and just save themselves from the torture and the killing. Historical records show that hundreds, thousands of followers of Jesus were tortured and killed because they believed that he had risen from the dead and weren't willing to deny it. These were men and women with spouses and families and children. We are told in the, in the historical records that Peter, Jesus' closest follower, was asked to deny that Jesus rose from the dead. And he wouldn't, so they crucified him upside down. James, the brother of Jesus, who saw his brother rise up from the grave and from death. They to took him to the top of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and said, James, if you don't deny that Jesus rose from the dead, we're going to throw you out up from here, down. He said, I can't deny it. I saw it with my own eyes. They threw him down from the Temple Mount. As he fell down and crashed to the ground, both his legs were fractured. And he was, as he was there, writhing in pain, the rulers came down and they said, James, will you at least now deny that Jesus rose from the dead? And James said, I can't. I can't deny it. I know what I saw. They were so mad at him, so angry with him, that they took a stone and crashed his skull in. And James died. What would possess people to hold to a fact when the repercussions of holding to that fact were torture, death, and harm for their families? What I'm trying to get at is this. It might be easy this morning to think, oh, this is just something we do out of tradition. It's faith. It's something we believe in our hearts. There's actually no factual basis for this. But I want to encourage you if you have those questions. That there is a lot of evidence that not that just that Jesus died, but that Jesus rose from the dead. And this brings us to the question, what if this is all true? What if Easter is true? Because if Easter is true, then everything changes. What if Jesus really did rise from the dead? If Jesus really rose from the dead, everything changes. You know, sometimes it's easier to believe with our head and know all the facts than to believe with our heart. Oftentimes it's easier to believe in the facts about Easter than to have a hope in the God of Easter from our hearts. Maybe you don't have a problem with the facts about Easter, but your problem is a heart problem. Somewhere along the line, even though you know the facts and you believe the facts, in your heart you've lost hope. Maybe you were younger and you had questions about God and Jesus. And the people you asked, whether they were your parents or your friends or your teachers, they didn't give you adequate answers. And you started losing some of your hope. Maybe you were hurt. Maybe you were hurt by people who professed to know God, to love God. Maybe you were hurt by a church. And because you were hurt by people who said that they believed in God, you don't come to church anymore. Your hope in all of that, those things has been lost. Maybe you are trying with all your heart to believe and have hope in God. But the season of, the, of your life that you are in, the situation that you are in is robbing you of hope. Maybe there is someone in your life who is sick and they are getting sicker and sicker and you don't know what to do. Maybe there was someone you pinned your hopes on a relationship that you thought would work out and that person has let you down badly. And in the midst of your hurt, you have no hope. 
What do you do when everything you have put your trust in is shaking? What do you do when you have lost all hope? Reading from Luke chapter 24, verse 13 onwards. That same day, which was Easter Sunday, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. What had happened? The Jesus that they followed and believed in, the Jesus that they had hoped in, had been crucified and murdered and killed. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? Isn't it funny? Jesus is playing games with them. They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, Cleopas replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked, as if he doesn't already know the answer. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles. Notice, they have started talking about him in the past tense already. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped. We had hoped. He was the Messiah or the Savior who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. We had hoped that he was the one, that Jesus was the one who was going to set us free. We had hoped that he was our redeemer. Maybe you had hoped that the doctor's report was going to be better. But when you got the report in your hand, you started losing hope. Maybe you had hoped and you put your, all your money in this investment, in this business. And the business is going downhill and you are losing hope. Maybe you have hoped on a person, one person who you knew if you were with them, everything would be okay. The person you thought would never let you down, but they have let you down. And your hope is starting to go. Maybe you had hoped that you could work things out in your marriage. And you have tried and tried and tried. But you are starting to lose hope. These two followers of Jesus, Cleopas and his friend, these two followers were at a point in their life where they were losing hope. Everything that they had hoped for was gone. I can imagine that maybe they were at one of the first sermons that Jesus spoke. The first time they saw him, I can imagine it. They saw a teacher who spoke such wonderful things and they were drawn to him. Maybe they were at that wedding in Cana in Galilee. But he turned water into wine. I can imagine that they were there on the seashore of Galilee on that stormy night and as they looked across the sea they could see Jesus walking on water. Maybe they were there in the crowd when Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 people. Maybe they were with him up close as he gave sight the person who was blind. Maybe they were next to him when, when he raised the dead. They had heard him speak of a kingdom that he would lead where the king was God. And little by little, hope started sprouting up in their hearts. Could this be the one who was coming to save them? Could this be the one who would set them free? Their hope increased little by little. And all of a sudden, in a moment, it was over. Just a few days earlier, Jesus had been arrested. Within hours, he was tried by the chief rulers and the priests. They'd heard the rumors that he was taken by the Roman soldiers into a courtyard 
And the soldiers whipped him with a whip that had shards of bone at the end. So that his back was torn open and broken. The rumors that they heard were evidently true because a few hours later, they stood there on the road in disbelief as Jesus was dragged, broken and bruised and bloodied, carrying a cross on his back. They stood in the crowd as the soldiers took those long nails and hammered it into his wrists. They heard the cries of anguish as the soldiers spiked him with a spear. They saw the cross be taken up a crown of thorns on Jesus' head with a board that said Jesus, King of the Jews mocking Jesus and everyone else who had hope that he could save them the man, Cleopas and his friend the man that they had put so much hope in was dead hope was dead what do you do when everything you put your hope in is lost. What do you do when hope dies? The Bible says that Cleopas and his friend downcast. They walk along with Jesus and they come to the place that they are going to rest. And they ask Jesus. Jesus, why don't? They didn't know he was Jesus. They said, would you come and just stay the night with us? And the Bible says this in verse 30. As they were eating, the Bible says this. As they sat down to eat. He took the bread, Jesus, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. We don't know what it was that made Cleopas recognize something in Jesus that he hadn't seen on the walk. But as Jesus took the bread and broke it, maybe they'd seen him breaking bread before. And they recognized him. Maybe he reached out with the bread. And they saw the scars of the nails on his hands. And in a moment, they realized that Jesus was with them. In the middle of his hopelessness and discouragement, Cleopas sees Jesus. And he realizes that Jesus is alive. Hope is alive. The Bible says that Cleopas and his friend, when they saw Jesus and he disappeared, said, Were not our hearts burning within us when he spoke to us? I'm confident this morning that even as we share God's word, there are a few people here, you've lost your hope in Jesus. But even as we are church this resurrection Sunday morning, that some of our hearts are starting to burn again. Maybe there is a Cleopas in the room, someone whose hope has been lost, someone whose circumstances are so bad that hope has died. What are you putting your hope in? I know that I can put my hope in money, in status, in my job, in my career, but I know that all those things are not permanent and one day that they will let me down and I will lose hope. You can put your hope in that relationship, in that person and even if they're the most wonderful person in the world, at some point they will let you down because no one's perfect and you will lose hope. What have you put your hope in this month? I want to remind you what I told you at the start of this message. If Easter is true, then all of it is true. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then everything changes. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, He is God. 
he is the only one that will never let us down if jesus rose from the dead then he is the only one we can have hope in i'm hoping to very clearly this morning you know if there was no easter sunday there would be no sunday in this church because all there would be was teaching a whole bunch of regulations rules religion religiosity because jesus didn't just come and tell you you know this is how you do it like we heard from pastor dishan junior you know he brought hope because he didn't only say things that he was going to do because he did what he said he would do and he rose again you see when he rose again all the theories went out of the window all the philosophies that stay on books and paper were made nothing because by rising again he went against the law of nature he went against everything that man thinks that man had in control and man could do and he proved that he is the son of the living god and you know the best part is he didn't do it to show off he didn't need to 
He didn't do it to say, hey, you know, I am the one. He did it because you and I needed somebody who was greater, who is greater than ourselves, who can do it for us, who can see us through. And that's the hope we have. When Cleophas lost his hope, you know why he lost his hope? Because he saw, he saw somebody else do some things. He saw it soon became a theory. It may have become a teaching in the future. And suddenly he realized there was no more, nothing. I'm on my own. And then he saw the resurrected Jesus and hope came back in. I don't know where you are this morning, but I can tell you one thing. The reason we worship here Sunday and every day is because, not because of a religion, not because of a church. Uh, you know, you, you change religion, you'll be changing like changing a shirt. You want to come to church, that's great. But it's not religion or church. It's when you have a personal experience with Lord God Almighty. He makes the difference. I want you this morning, if you ever decide never to come back here again, at least to give God one adequate opportunity in your life. And open your heart and life to Him and say, Lord, I need a miracle. If everything you said is true, I want you to do it for me. I want my sins forgiven. I want to tell you, you can try to be good. You and I know, we, the Bible says it very clearly. We don't do the things we should do. We do things we should not do. You know why? Because we are human. You, me, all of us, we are human. And we fail. But God gives hope by saying, you know, I have paid a price for you. I've died on the cross. Like I said on Good Friday, you know, a lot of people tell us if you do this, then you can have this. If you do that, you can then, be, uh, you know, get a better, be, better place in life. And, and Jesus doesn't say do this. Jesus says, I went on the cross and I've done it for you. You don't have to do anything. It's already done. You know, a, a dear sister in our church, her life was marvelously changed by God. She didn't know Christ. And one day she came to the same question of giving Jesus Christ an opportunity in her life. And she opened her life. God came in, forgave her of her sins and cleansed her and made her a new person. She began to come to church. At that time we were at Six Lane in Kolubitia. And you know, she used to come to church and her husband was well-to-do, eminent lawyer, he was a chairman of Consul Exports at that time and, and also director of, of a shipping company. I would say he was brash, maybe a bit arrogant. And he would allow her to go to church as long as sharp on the dot when he, the time he comes to pick her, she has to be out. And I remember he used to come and... Uh, but if, if it's two minutes over time, he would park his car right in front of the door. In six lane, you could park the cars right out. And he would jam the horn and blare on the horn. I remember my mother, when she was here then, she would go out and talk to him very lovingly. And actually they became kind of friends over that period. But this man, carrying a bit of arrogance, and uh, well to do in life having what he needed that was his outside on the inside there was a void that could never be filled by money, power or position so one day as the wife kept praying for him he was in Australia and he was in a hotel room and he turned on the TV and, and suddenly guess what a, a, a preacher was preaching in Australia, you have a lot of Christian programs. And the preacher said something that caught this lawyer's mind, or got a hold of his mind and heart. The preacher said, you know, everything that Jesus Christ claimed could have been just another teaching. 
He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the son of God. To die on the cross. But he said then he rose from the dead. Just as he said in three days. So that you can have a changed life. So that he is alive and well. And he can do it for you. And you know forgive me don't get offended. But this is what the preacher said. The preacher said. Either. Jesus Christ is everything that he said he is. He's the son of God. He died on the cross. He shed his blood and he rose again. If not, he's the bastard son of a carpenter. You have a choice to make. Is he the king of kings and the lord of lords, the son of God who has risen up for you or is he the bastard son, illegitimate son of a carpenter? You have a choice. I want to tell you that day, Lucky Vikramanayaka came to confrontation and an encounter with Jesus Christ that changed his life forever. Changed his life forever. Brought peace that could never be brought by money, power or position. I want to tell you, you don't have to come back here. It's not about church. We'd love to have you, but if you don't want, that's fine. But don't leave here without having Jesus Christ. As personal Lord and Savior resurrected to give you that hope that will never leave you. I want everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. Please don't look around. This is so important. You know, we've seen miracles happen. In the last service, we had people who walked in for the first time. One guy was laying on a mat at the back. This is just an hour and a half ago. And God raised him up and he was completely healed. He came on the stage, testified. Not the lady said, first time she ever came to the church, God healed. But you see, healing and all those other miracles, I will pray for you in a moment. Those are secondary to what I'm talking to you about now. What I'm telling you now is a miracle that does not only last for time, but it lasts for eternity. Some of you, I want to tell you, you have great fear. One of the greatest fears you have is what happens if you die? Where are you going? What's going to happen? I want to tell you that's what Jesus Christ did. In the three days that he hung on the cross and before he rose again, the Bible says he went down to the pit of hell and he destroyed death, hell and the grave. So you and I can have eternal life. Don't ever fear. If you receive Jesus as your savior, when you close your eyes here, you open it in his arms. But you see the choice is yours. He will never come by force. He comes into your life only by invitation. The hope that Jesus brought. The hope to his disciples. The hope to Cleophas and his friend. Is the same hope he offers to you 2,000 years later. But you have to make a choice. While everybody's eyes are closed, every head is bowed. If you have not given Jesus Christ an opportunity to come into your life to be your Lord, your Savior to forgive you of all your sin I would if I can beg you I'd beg you give God that opportunity give God the opportunity to say Lord here's my life I want you to forgive me of all my sins I want the blood of Jesus to cleanse me and then I want the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit to come and rule and reign in my life. If you are here this morning and you're saying, Pastor, please pray for me. I want to tell you thousands have already done this and they're sitting right around you. I have done this. This is not about coming and joining a club. This is about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't look at the person next to you and say, I'm embarrassed. I don't know that I should raise my hand. I should not. If you are not sure Maybe you've done it long time ago and, and, and it's not there. I want you this Easter resurrection morning, the morning that brings hope for you to say, Lord, 
I need you in my life. If I die, I know where I'm going. While on earth, I know you're going to be with me. I want you to say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want my sins forgiven. I want peace and joy to flow into my life. If that is you, don't look around. Don't wait for anybody else. I want you to raise your hand and show it to me. I'm going to pray for you. Yes, 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 yes. Is there anyone else? Just raise your hand. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, yes. Raise your hand right up so I may see it. Yes, 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 yes. On the balcony, anybody. If you want to make this prayer, don't miss it out. Raise your hand and show it to me. Yes, I see that hand. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Yes, I see that hand. You may put your hands down. You know, many, many hands have gone up and I thank God for that. Because you have to take the first step. You take the first step, God takes every other step needed to come towards you. But you have to make a stand. You have to make a stand. You know, many hands have gone up, but in my heart, I don't want to let this go. I feel some of you, the Holy Spirit, that you don't know what it is speaking to you. That is the Holy Spirit is convicting you, is telling you, you need this prayer. And you know you need it. Don't look around. If you need it, I don't know how many opportunities you're going to have. This may be your last one. I don't want you to miss it. If you didn't raise your hand, one more round. I'm going to ask you quickly, raise your hand. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, yes. Yes, if you feel you need to surrender to Christ, raise your hand and put it down. And we are going to pray for you. Yes, I see that hand. Thank you, thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes, I see that hand. If I missed your hand, it doesn't matter. God saw it. I'm going to ask everybody, keep your heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask everybody who raised your hand, stand to your feet where you are, please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Just stand. Don't look around. Just keep praying, everybody. This is a solemn moment, you know. And you know, I don't want you to be embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed about Jesus Christ just because somebody else. If you raise your hand, stand to your feet, please. Because I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know there are a few more. I want you to quickly stand up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are one or two more. Some on this side. Please stand up quickly. God wants to minister to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That's right. You know, don't look to man. Man can't do anything for us. Only God can do it. Let's stand for God. Takes the courage of our convictions. Takes a real man, real woman to just stand and say, God, I need you this morning. Thank you. Thank you on the balcony for standing. Thank you below. Is there one more person who needs to stand? I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else? Is there one more person? You feel like you should be standing. Then you should stand. I want to encourage you. I'm going to ask you one more step. Right? I want you to come in front here, close to me. Please come. Everybody standing, come. Come and stand here. We're going to pray. You know, my heart is very burdened this morning because I feel there's still someone you're fighting with God. You have put man over God. You're more conscious about man. While everybody keeps your heads bowed, eyes closed, please get up and come. I want to pray for you. You need Jesus. Don't miss yourself. On the balcony, would you please come this way? Bring your stuff with you. I'm going to wait for you. Please come. Somebody on the balcony, help them to come. Come on this side. Thank you. Come this way. Just walk to this side and come down the stairs. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you know Jesus is here? Would you close your eyes and raise your hands? Mm, Jesus. 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 There is something 
and come to the front. ask you to open your eyes for a moment and look at me this church has seen a lot of miracles we've seen people who were dead come back to life because of prayer we've seen cancers come out of people we've seen God do marvelous things on our Thursday miracle night just in the last month three people who had cancer have been totally healed but you know none of those miracles can compare with what is about to happen here this morning. To us as a church, this is the greatest miracle because this is not about joining a church or changing a religion. This is about God Almighty loving you, caring for you, knowing everything that is going on in your life and still going to be there for you, still going to see you through. You see, all we're doing is we're going to pray to Him and like his word says, he died on the cross, shed his blood, so our sins can be forgiven. And you know, that's all we need tonight, this morning. We want our sins forgiven. We want the peace. We want the guilt to be taken away. So when you pray this prayer, I'm going to ask you to make sure that you make it your prayer. I know some of you have done this before. Maybe you're doing it again. Some of you came with a friend. Let's just pray together. Church, will you join us? Right, let's all join together and we're going to pray a prayer. And this prayer, we are asking Jesus to take care, take over our lives. I'm going to ask some of you who are going to help to pray. Please come and stand with the loved ones in front. Come, come, some of you youth leaders, especially pastors. Um, and, and, and we're going to pray together. Congregation, can I ask you to stand also? And after I finish praying, I'm going to ask you to stay where you are, okay? Don't go. Stay where you are. Because right after we pray for the greatest miracle, we're going to pray for healing. We're going to pray for financial breakthrough. We're going to pray for family situations. We're going to pray that God will do a miracle in you. I, I, I felt this from Good Friday. I felt this this morning. I feel it again in this service that God wants you to know that you don't have to fear. There are some of you who are going through fear. Fear is riding you. Fear is controlling you. And I want you, even as we finish the prayer of salvation and pray, to realize that today, fear will be broken in your life. And you will be released because of the resurrection power of Jesus. You don't have to fear. Okay, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask you in front. Repeat this prayer after me. Okay, but make it your prayer. I don't just parrot what I'm saying. Make it from your heart and God is going to make a difference. Church, will you join me? Why will you join me? Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus I come to you this morning because I need you. I'm tired of doing things on my own. Trying to manage my world. I can't do it anymore. I surrender to you. You are the author. You are the finisher of my faith and my life. I surrender to my creator. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. I repent 
When you say I repent it means I'm not going back to that Say Lord I'm not going back I will not go back I'm turning from those ways I will not do those things I should not do You know you're making You're not just miming a prayer You mean it in your heart Say Lord I'm walking away from my sin From my unfaithfulness From my cheating From whatever I've done wrong I'm walking away from that And I'm walking to you That's repentance Tell him Tell him Lord I'm not going to get into that sin Not into that habit I'm walking away Help me He's there you say help he moves in say lord help me right now help me i need you i need you let's say this dear jesus, dear jesus. please, please. Let's say it loud please, please. Wash, me wash me with your precious blood, with your precious blood. that you shed, on calvary. you shed on calvary cleanse my mind cleanse my, mind. Cleanse my, heart. Cleanse my heart cleanse my whole being, my whole being. i invite you to now come and live in my heart take over my life be my God and my king rule my life I submit to you I want to be your child I will not serve anybody else but I will serve you thank you for hearing my prayer thank you for cleansing me and thank you for being my God in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Father, I pray for my brother, my sister. I pray that the anointing of God will flow through, that you'll break through every bondage, every barrier. No demon in hell, no man on earth can frustrate your plan in their life. Lord, they have given their life to you. I pray in Jesus' name that your peace, your joy will flow right now. And from this point, they are your children with your anointing washed in your blood that they will walk forward having you in their hearts never to turn back, never to look to the left or to the right knowing that God is with them. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now stay where you are. If you are here, I know some of you are here in front and you have a physical ailment, you're sick in body. This same Jesus who can take your life and change it forever can heal you right now healing is a patch on this body you know when you die the who cares what has happened but God can heal you you know he can take the pain away now he can just bring his power and manifest his healing through you but some of you have greater than that kind of pain you're going through a terrible heartache your broken heart because of a relationship breakup. Your marriage is, is, is in a bit of a mess. Or financially, you have a huge burden. I want to tell you, Jesus is here. And where he is, all things are possible. So if you need a miracle from God on this resurrection morning, I want you to raise your hand. If you need a miracle from God, raise your hand right up. Take your other hand and put it on your heart. Okay, and we're going to pray. God is going to do a miracle. God knows your heart. You, can, you just cry out to Him and say, Lord, I'm going to ask you to put a bit of a specific note into your prayer. Say, God, in the next seven days, I want to see a sign of how you're moving in this prayer. How you're going to move. Seven days. By next Sunday. Before next Sunday, actually. Not by. Before next Sunday. Lord, I'm going to see healing. Some of you are going to be healed right now. Right now, the pain is going to go. Right now, like he did in the last service, he's going to touch you. Some of you, your big burden is going to be lifted up because Jesus is the burden bearer. You know, when you cast your burden on him this morning, don't pick it up before you go home. I want you to just give it to him. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, raise your hand. One hand up, one hand on your heart. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Let's pray right now. Let's believe God for the miracle. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, you see the bodies that need to be healed. You have, Lord, through resurrection, shown us that the stripes you bore on your back have over fought to, to redeem us. And I pray right now, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, redeem these, redeem pain. I rebuke you and I ask that you leave 
right now in the name of Jesus. Pain, leave this body. Sickness, I rebuke you. Leave right now in Jesus' name. Frozen shoulder right now in Jesus' name. Back problems, arthritis, knee problems, internal sicknesses, blood issues in Jesus' name. Cancer, whatever it may be in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, healing virtue, flow, 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 flow right now. Father, thank you for healing. Thank you for touching. Thank you in Jesus' name. Lord, I bring every financial need to you. Come on, believe with me. Believe God to do a financial miracle. Lord, the financial needs, I pray in Jesus' name that you will lift the burden up. Lord, you will open the windows of heaven and you will pour your blessing on these who are breaking Lord because of financial burden I pray today they're not alone they will look to you and even as they look to you in the next seven days the window of windows of heaven will open and you will begin to pour out your blessing I pray for every family situation every broken hearted situation Lord the rifts between husband and wife between children and parents, between loved ones and relationships, boyfriend, girlfriend, and, and, and in, in other office situations and family situations, bring complete healing. You're the only one who can heal a broken heart. No medicine, no doctor, no money in the world. But you can heal a broken heart. And I pray right now that your blessing would flow. Lord, lift up the burdens. I want you all to see that you're handing the burden to God now. Hand it over. Say, Lord, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm handing it to you. Okay, just hand it. Go on. Hand it. Hand it over. See yourself handing it over to God. Just give it over. Give it over. Give it over. Off your shoulder. Your shoulder is not big enough to carry this. God's shoulders are big enough. Just give it to Him right now. Give it to Him. Lord, I hand it to you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. I want you to raise your hands and say, Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise. Okay, how many of you believe God heard our prayer? I want you to raise both hands and come on, verbally thank Him. Come on, raise your voice. You raise your voice when you get mad at somebody. You raise your voice when somebody hits a sixer. You can raise your voice to God. Come on and say, thank you, Jesus. Because this morning, I know you're alive. You're not in the grave. I know you heard my prayer and I thank you. Come on, church. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I give you the glory. I give you the honor. I give you the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.